we have a lot of information without going into it on things that would be very embarrassing to Vladimir Putin. We have a P-tape on Putin, is that what you're well, talking not, about? It's not a P-tape. Okay. It is politics. It, it's tough stuff. It's a tough business. Did you see where Biden wants to take me? I wish we were in high school. I could take him behind the gym. I will not yield to the gentleman, and the gentleman will observe regular order. These damn Bill the Carter all the damn time. Small, insecure, money grubber. Most despicable thing I have seen in my time in politics. Politics can get messy. So if you want to lace them up and go a few rounds, expect a bloody nose, which is what makes President Trump must watch television. He's a counterpuncher. And neither the Mueller investigation nor the government shutdown keeps this man from swinging back. And that's true even if recent polling suggests his approval ratings right now are tumbling. But what happens when those he's swinging at wear the uniform and then they decide to leave? I'll break it all down and then sit down with a woman who became the highest ranking female in Pentagon history. That's Michelle Flournoy. She's here. And of course, I've also got your puppet regime. Huh? Hello? Hello, my precious. Oh, God, Stephen Miller, not now. Don't you sleep? But first, a word from the folks who help us keep the lights on. Our military is the most powerful on Earth by far. And America, America is again winning each and every day. The state of our union is strong. President Trump used to love a man in uniform, the decisive stature and command structure of it all. Or maybe it was just those brass buttons. They are brass, by the way, not gold. But in any case, when Trump took office, he seemed intent on finding his own crop of patents to run things. My generals and my military I'll leave that decision to myself and my generals and my admirals. Even my general and my various other generals. I want to thank a couple of the generals. Some of my great generals are in the back. And these are central casting. If I'm doing a movie, I pick you, General. During the campaign, Trump met former Navy Admiral James Stavridis, General David Petraeus. But he ultimately decided on James Mattis, John Kelly, Michael Flynn, and later H.R. McMaster to fill his inner circle. The thing is, they're all gone. Some were fired, others had enough. Still others said they're not working for Trump. Comments like this probably didn't help. I know more about ISIS than th the generals do, believe me. Now, of course, military men usually want to sustain American military commitments overseas. And Trump generally doesn't. He publicly questions the value of NATO, and he seems to want to end the long-standing US entanglements like in Afghanistan and in Syria. But there's more to it than that. So let's break down what this doctrine of disentanglement and realignment actually looks like through the president's preferred communication style, Twitter. <laughs> of course, read by our very own felt version of America's commander in chief. We have defeated ISIS in Syria. My only reason for being there during the Trump presidency. The United States has mostly defeated ISIS in Syria. The caliphate, the territory that they actually captured and were governing, almost 98% of that has been stripped away from them. There is no more caliphate in Syria. And indeed, most of the ISIS fighters have been killed or been forced into hiding. Now, that doesn't mean every member of ISIS in Syria is no longer there. And there are certainly many who are sympathetic you can't militarily bomb an idea out of existence. And so, you know, it's not as if the Americans can end ISIS, that war on terror. Um, also, if the Americans want to fight ISIS going forward, not having troops on the ground doesn't stop them from using drones or sea-based missiles. 
One thing that is interesting is that the reasons that many are given for keeping troops on the ground in Syria, that you want to have leverage against the Russians or the Iranians or defend the Kurds, they may be reasonable, but they have nothing to do with why Congress authorized military engagement, which was specifically to fight ISIS. So on this point, Trump actually has more to his argument than many of those that are opposing him. Our great country is respected again in Asia. You will see the fruits of our long but successful trip for many years to come. Many years. Many, many years. I have to call fake news on this one. The United States is respected a lot less in Asia today than it was 5, 10, 20 years ago. Now, in part, that has nothing to do with the president. That's because China is getting a lot more powerful. They're writing really big checks around the region. Their military is a lot stronger. Their technology is a lot more capable. And the Americans aren't doing that, right? I mean, there's no Marshall Plan uh, in Asia coming from the U.S., no big infrastructure projects that the Americans are developing. Trump, though, has made it worse. His unwillingness to coordinate with allies when he decides to have a summit with North Korean President Kim Jong-un, or the fact that he goes after the Japanese and the South Koreans and the Chinese at the same time in terms of hitting them on trade, has really left American allies imbalanced. And you know, no question they recognize that they still want a good relationship with the U.S. because America is the world's biggest superpower, but the level of respect for the United States is decreasing, and the amount of hedging happening across America's Asian allies is going up. Europe has to pay their fair share for military protection, okay? The European Union for many years has taken advantage of us on trade, and then they don't live up to their military commitments through NATO. Things must change fast. It is certainly true that America's NATO allies put a lot less money into defense, their own and collective, than the Americans do. And that's particularly true of Germany, which is the largest economy in NATO after the United States. A lot of American presidents have been angry that the Europeans are free riding. Obama, heck, even John F. Kennedy said they'd take advantage of the Americans. But Trump has been louder about it. They are starting to increase their spend incrementally, but certainly nowhere near fast enough and both Trump and a lot of other Americans are gonna to continue to be upset about that. Melania and I send our greetings to those celebrating the Lunar New Year. Today, people across the United States and around the world, who wrote this? I didn't write this. What is a Lunar, what is a Lunar New Year? What they celebrated in China? China? Anyway. <clears throat> Please don't ever make a puppet of me. <laughs> They're really cute. Okay. Yeah. Michelle Flournoy, uh, managing partner of West Exec Advisors and former undersecretary of policy for defense. Yes. Almost deputy secretary for defense, or at least former Secretary Mattis asked you and you declined. Uh, does that look like a good decision these days? I think so. <laughs> yes. When he left, uh, certainly the, the conversations around the country were, oh my God, we lost the adult. Now the wheels are going to fall off. You, of course, know the secretary very well. Um, tell me how you think about it. Well, I do think that one of the most sort of moderating influences on, on President Trump was Secretary Mattis um, when he was in office. There were countless times when the president was, you know, about to make a decision that was not in American interests, that Secretary Mattis sort of was, went over to the White House and sort of talked him through it, you know, put the issue in context, uh, urged him to take a different direction, and convinced him to sort of step back. Did Mattis um, feel that he just couldn't be effective anymore? I mean, we know certainly some of the issues they came to a disagreement over, um, the intervention in Syria, um, the decision to send troops to the southern border yeah. over Thanksgiving. How, how do you assess that? I think Jim Mattis has got a great deal of integrity. He's a very principled person, and he takes the oath 
to the Constitution that he took very seriously. Um, I think his letter actually says it all, his resignation letter. Where he... Where he was very clear um, that he thought that we were heading in the wrong direction and particularly that we were damaging our alliances. And I think he and many of us view our alliances as a unique strategic source of strategic advantage for the United States. Um, and those were being, you know, very much hurt in a way that was damaging U.S. credibility in the long term. So do you think Mattis misread the president when he first said, I'm going to take this job? Do you think he believed that he could have more influence than he did? Do you think he, at the end of the day he just lost patience and said, that's it enough? I mean, because clearly there is a change in mind uh, I, that occurs over that trajectory. I think when you have a, a career military officer— um, take on a role like Secretary of Defense. It's the first time it's happened since George C. Marshall 70 years ago. Um, I think they, you know, I think Jim Mattis took the job out of a sense of duty. You know, the other contributing factor here is that after John Bolton took on the National Security Advisor role, basically the NSC process stopped. There are no principals meetings, or very rarely. There are very few, if any, NSC meetings. There's a paper process for sort of signing off on things, but the whole process that's designed to bring a variety of views to a president, including dissent, uh, to help that president make better decisions or more informed decisions, that's broken down. It's just, it's not happening. Because of Bolton? I mean, he certainly has the bureaucratic experience. Yeah, he, but he doesn't see the value in that. I think there, you know, every national security advisor has two roles. One is to basically run, be the systems administrator of the interagency process, ensure the president is hearing the views of all of his advisors. Um, the second is to personally advise the president on national security. Bolton seems to have only taken on the second and disregarded or discounted the, the first. What does deterrence of the Russians and separately the Chinese yeah. mean to you? We have to convince Putin that the costs of aggression, uh, military aggression, are so great that he dare not go there. Right now, you know, we see that Russia is certainly not deterred below the level of conventional conflict. You know, they they meddled in our elections with virtually no cost. They're meddling in European political systems with virtually no cost. They have, you know, took over Crimea uh, and destabilized Ukraine with minimal cost. So I don't think Vlad Vladimir Putin's thinking, feeling very deterred at the moment. And this is true under both administrations. Yes, it's right. a problem that started with Obama and, and continues with Trump. And it's not just a military problem. I mean, deterrence has to have, you have to really use effectively all of the instruments of, of our power. Well, we have, of course, we do have now um, more forward deployment yes. uh, for NATO in yes. these countries, yep. including the Baltic states yep. and Poland. Yeah. Um, but when you talk about deterring the Russians, of course, uh, our experience over the past decade has largely not been about conventional warfare right. and tanks rolling it's across well, borders. Right. It's all the same it's symmetrical stuff. It's right. below that. What, what needs to change? Yeah. So I think the, the heart of any deterrence strategy is really understanding what is the adversary value. Mm -hmm. And in this system, it is what is Vladimir Putin value. We have a lot of information without going into it on things that would be very embarrassing to Vladimir Putin, illicit activities, all kinds of things that he's been involved in over time. We that have a would, P tape on Putin, is that what you're well, talking no, about? No, it's not a P tape. Okay. But I mean, I think there's just a lot of information that could be brought out. Um, I think there are things that we could do um, in the cyber domain, things that we could do in the um, in information economic domain that would be make it very clear to him, um, don't go there. Tell me where you want to spend money on dealing with China right now. You know, I think one of the mistakes we tend to make is counting shiny objects as the primary metric of our defense. I know they're strength. building a third so, aircraft carrier. So, right. That is a very shiny so, object. So, you know, how many aircraft carriers, you know, 355 ship Navy, how many Air Force squadrons, how many, you know, tanks, et cetera. I am more interested now on, you know, we have a certain a legacy force that we're going to have for decades because we've already made the investment, the capital investment. 
So the questions in my mind are um, where, you know, where are the trade-offs between more quantity versus capability that makes those systems relevant? So for example, if you take aircraft carriers, we now know that the Chinese have systems that can sync our carriers. We know that they now have air defenses, layered defenses, that would make it very difficult for the aircraft on the carriers to actually reach and penetrate those defenses and actually hold targets at risk. So I'm more interested in saying, you know, at what point do you forego an extra carrier battle group and take all that money and invest in electronic warfare, um, the systems that will defeat the Chinese m missile that can take down our ships, the munitions that can penetrate those air defenses, the, the refueling and the um, other steps that would give us back range, the mi mixing in unmanned systems, which can both air and undersea, that could give the carrier new relevance. So it's really a question of what are all the capabilities that we have to invest in, the new technologies. I want to ask you kind of an existential strategic question, mm -hmm. which is when I think about the Cold War, there's an argument to be made that the Americans forced the Soviets to their knees in the arms race because of the spend. Mm -hmm. Our economy was mm -hmm. much bigger than theirs. Right. They weren't able to keep right. up. Right. Ultimately, Gorbachev had to give it up. The Chinese economy is likely to outstrip the American economy in absolute size in the next mm -hmm. decade. As we look ahead to the next 10, 20, 30 years, if that were continue, if we were to start to see that a Chinese economy mm -hmm. is getting much larger than the U.S., their gap is much mm -hmm. bigger, mm -hmm. at what point does that affect the way you think strategically about what the United States should be trying to do in terms of global defense? Well, I think it's a huge argument for going back to our alliances. If you take the U.S. alone, you're, you're right. But if you take the U.S. economy and the European economies, or, you know, all the NATO and EU countries, Japan, Australia, South Korea, if you were to take the democratic economies and our allies' economies— and put them together in the sense of, you know, a, a, a set of countries who are trying to work together, shape the Chinese calculus, compete where we need to, then it's a different ballgame. Then, then you're in a very different position. And that takes a strategy, it takes a serious amount of diplomacy, and it takes embracing um, creating tra high standard trade agreements that actually give us advantages. I mean, one of the biggest strategic mistakes that I think will go down in history TPP. is TPP. Trans-Pacific Partnership. We you really didn't like the Americans pulling out of that. We negotiated a fantastic trade agreement with our allies and partners in Asia that would have raised the standards and allowed us, gave, gave, would have given us tremendous competitive advantage along with our partners vis-a-vis -vis a rising China. And then we walked away from it. We. The Trump administration walked away from it. Now, a new American president could rejoin if that person chose well, to. Uh, yes. But uh, in the meantime, you know, China has gained some significant advantage because of the perception that the U.S. has pulled back and created a vacuum. What's the thing that concerns you most today in terms of China's stance and capabilities vis-a-vis -vis the United States? I think the, the most, the thing that concerns me most is that they uh, have an authoritarian system where they can strategically invest in the fundamentals that will allow them to compete successfully in the future. You know, STEM education, technology, you know, on and on and on. Whereas we have not got our internal house in order. We are not investing in the education, uh, you know, in educating the people we need. We are not investing in science and technology and research and development. We are not investing in infrastructure. We are not investing in the, the drivers of our own economic competitiveness long term, especially vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, so, I, and, I, and then you couple that with their a, a concerted campaign of intellectual property theft um, on the part of China. And, you know, we're... We're in a lot of areas where we've always assumed technological advantage. That is fast eroding, if not already shifting to China. What are the sudden sea changes that are most likely to come in the near-term future 
from changes in technology on the battlefield? I think um, the first, uh, the, the two we haven't talked about are cyber and space. Mm -hmm. So if you look at Chinese doctrine, their ideal scenario is if it comes to conflict, they launch a series of crippling cyber attacks on our critical infrastructure here and our space architecture that basically prevents the U.S. military from moving that pre key, prevents us from even projecting power into the region. And so it's over before it starts, and they break our will before it even we even get there. That is their ideal scenario. We know that because of public discussion of military doctrine in China, because of what they're spending money on? How do it's, we know that? It, I think we, you know, people who, who read their military journals, trans, do the translations and so forth, I think that it's a scenario that is talked about in military circles in China, both public, you know, both in publicly available materials and, and otherwise. Now, given that Chinese critical infrastructure is controlled by, you know, in a sense, a smaller number of vertically integrated government mm -hmm. controlled and linked organizations. Mm -hmm. Aren't they more vulnerable to those sorts of cyber attacks than the Americans would be? Um, I mean, they have their own vulnerabilities, but actually one of the challenges we have is most of our critical infrastructure is not owned or operated by the government. Right. And so we are as, as only as strong as the weakest link. Um, so you so know, they're more hardened in that regard, you're saying? Well, I'm not sure, it's, but it's not a necessarily a symmetric thing because we, you know, we have to project power to get there. They're, that's, you know, they're there and they have their home region. And so if they're invading Taiwan or they're you know, going to, getting into a conflict with one of our allies or partners in the region, we have to project power to get there. And, and again, as I said, um, you know, they're going to try to stop, interrupt that process. Um, well, so, so what interests me about this yeah. is that historically the way we used to think about the Chinese, right, is when military doctrine is, you know, they could take a hit of a few hundred million people in, you know, sort of yeah. a horrible nuclear war and they'd still be around yeah. and we kind of wouldn't be, right? Yeah. Um, and, I mean, when you talk about switching that to cyber and space, uh, they're vulnerable. I mean, uh, that, well, the uh, it's not clear is, to me that why they would necessarily prefer that as a doctor. Well, because of preferring that, it's it's a matter of you know they if they were able to do that with minimal actual casualties to the Amer I mean, so now you've crippled the American military, but you haven't killed Americans or you know hope if you if you're if they if, you know they they hope not to actually they ha you haven't. Kinetically struck the American homeland, and so they're trying to avoid the sort of risk of nuclear escalation. It's more a matter of influencing decision and will. You know, if they make it too hard, if they create a fait accompli, and they make it too hard for us to respond. Um, so it's a leveler. It's almost like a you know, can you create enough of a debate internally to say, look, this is you know. Why do we care about Taiwan, or why do we care about this, or why do we care about that? Maybe we should just stop. This is too hard. Michelle Florey, thank you so much. Thank you. And now for something completely different, even though we have it every week, I've got your puppet regime. Uh, can't sleep. Bob Mueller. House investigations. Russia. Collusion. Ah. 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 Hey, somebody, can I get some help here? A Xanax? Something? Ah, what a disgrace. Even the bedroom staff has quit this White House. Huh? Hello? Hello, my precious. Oh, God, Stephen Miller, not now. Don't you sleep? Okay, look, nobody knows more about lullabies than me. A lullaby will now be sung by me to me. <clears throat> the itsy bitsy spider went up the water spout. Down came. Now, how can a spider just walk into the water spout? Isn't there a wall around the water spout? Huh? Who now? I was just meddling in your alpha brainwaves, and I see you can't sleep. It's terrible. Yes, sing to me. Rock a bye, baby. 
tree tops. When the bell breaks, the cradle will fall, and down will come baby NATO and all. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Vladimir. Now I'm ready for my usual soothing bedtime routine again. Alexa, please turn on Fox News. These people are coming into our country to do violence. They are rapists. They are criminals. They are not the law of the country. Let's get them out of our country. That's our show this week. We'll be back next week. Don't miss it. Please don't miss it. In the meantime, if you like what you've seen, check us out on gzeromedia.com.